Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm super excited to be here. This is such a great conference. Thank everybody. Thank you all so much for coming. Uh, so uh, first, I wanted to give a little bit of background uh, uh, on myself. My computer is. OK, so I just love this framing that Emily had yesterday, so I asked if I could borrow the slide. Uh, I, years and years ago, used to be a front-end engineer, and I worked on web performance. And I got to do web performance for Google Docs and Google Web Search, and it was tons of fun. But then, eight years ago, I moved to this mysterious aisle of browser vendor. And uh, I still work on performance, uh, but I've been doing it indefinitely like, with a different uh, point of view. So I wanted to tell you a bit about the work that I've done and kind of take a trip to like, my little corner of the aisle of browser vendor. Uh, so what, what is my corner? Uh, I've worked on mostly, uh, for several years, I led performance testing in Chrome. And recently, I trained, changed roles onto the Chrome Speed Metrics team. And that's the, the team that tries to make performance metrics, not just for Chrome, but also for web developers, like first contentful paint, largest contentful paint, time to interactive, things like that. Uh, so here's our agenda for our trip to the Isle of Browser Vendor, or just my little corner, really. There's a lot going on in this island that we really won't be able to get into. Uh, so first, we're going to talk about uh, metrics and the work that the speed metrics team's done. Uh, like what makes a good metric, what are the use cases for our metrics, and I'll go over an example of developing one of these metrics. Then I, I wanted to go back and talk about um, once you have a metric, you, you want to monitor it. You want to monitor it in the lab, and you want to monitor it in a wild, and go over a little bit about uh, the lessons I've learned over the years. Uh, another thing that I've done uh, is when regressions slip through our lab, like try to help figure out like, how to track them down in the real world. So some things I learned there as well. So let's start with metrics. So you're probably familiar with this. It's just the, the Chrome DevTools uh, performance panel. We have our own performance tool, but it has a lot more information that's just like, kind of confusing. So I thought this got the point across really well, though, is that if you think about metrics you can make, there's so much in this panel you could measure, like how much time all those different subsystems, all those different colors are like different subsystems, how much time was spent in each, uh, what are the long tasks, uh, when did the layout and paint occur, how many bytes of JavaScript, how many network requests. It's really overwhelming, and in fact, in Chrome, we have actually thousands of performance metrics. So the thing that we've been working on the most over the last several years is really focusing down on really good top-level metrics and trying to get the whole team and, and eventually web developers rallied around those. So what is a good top-level metric? Uh, first off, we, we really want to measure key user experiences. Uh, we don't want to measure just you know, numbers that don't necessarily, maybe they correlate to the user experience. We want to measure the actual user experience. And the experiences we're, we're most focused on right now is loading web pages, responding to user in input, and uh, smooth scrolling and animations. So I'll talk a little bit about what we feel after working on this space for a couple years makes a good top-level metric. There's a bunch of properties, and sometimes they can uh, really be at odds with each other. So we try to keep these in mind when we're doing designs. First, uh, and most importantly, a metric should be representative of an actual user experience. So I'm using representative in the sense to mean like what are we trying to measure? Are we trying to measure like some good things to try to measure might be like how long does it take to respond to a user input? Uh, something that's not as representative is like how long does it take to parse the HTML? Uh, second, uh, they should be accurate. So if representative is about what the metric aims to measure, accurate is how well it does that. Uh, so we use a lot of film strips in measuring accuracy, like looking at you know, uh, runs of various sites, and we do a lot of studies of, of uh, larger amounts of data to validate. Next, a metric should be interpretable. That means it, the value of the metric should be really easy to understand. So for example, if I told you that the main content of your site loaded in 500 milliseconds, uh, but then it took uh, two seconds to respond to the first input, you don't really need to know much about my metrics to understand that like, that, that first input was a problem, but the site like, displays content pretty fast. Uh, so one thing that's kind of interesting is that uh, a metric can be interpretable without actually being simple. Uh, simple is about the way that the metric is computed. Uh, speed index, for example, is, is not that simple. It's like the average time of things displaying on the page. 
but because it's a time and a point in time, you can kind of understand what it is, even if you're, you can understand how to optimize it, even if you're not like fully certain why it's at that exact point and not like two milliseconds left or right. I should go back actually, um, why is it important for a metric computation to be simple then if it can be interpretable? Uh, the, the reasons are, there's a couple. One is that if it has a complex implementation, every time that you have to add to it or uh, improve it or handle an edge case, it gets more and more difficult to, to fix things, just, just like any other type of code. The other thing is ideally that we will be able to um, give these to web developers. Uh, so part of that will be going through the standards process and making sure that other vendors were able to implement it. The simpler it is, the more possible that is. Uh, if the other vendors were not able to implement it, we want it to be polyfilled. And the same thing, it has to be simple. Uh, next, uh, a totally different thing, the metric should be stable. Uh, for us, this means that, let's say you have the same web page and the same version of Chrome, everything's the same, you run the metric 100 times, you should get very similar values. If your values are bouncing up and down, there's a lot of noise in the metric, a lot of variation, it's gonna be really hard to tell if there's like a change in the metric. Did you make it better or worse, or is it just noise? Related, but not quite the same, is whether a metric is elastic. So if a metric is elastic, a small change in performance corresponds to a small change in the metric, and a large change uh, in performance would correspond to a large change in the metric. Uh, some, sometimes when, when something is not elastic, it's because of what, what we call a cliff in the metric. So for example, time to interactive. Uh, we're looking for, for the time when, uh, so, so we say like uh, 50 millisecond bits of JavaScript, like that's okay, but, but more than that is, is not okay. The page is, is not interactive, you're, you're gonna try to click. So what if a page has like uh, something that's going between 49 and 51 milliseconds? That cliff of 50 can really change the time to interactive and make it not elastic. Uh, next, ideally, a good metric is real time. Uh, this can have a couple of meanings. Uh, first, it just, uh, the overhead of the metric can't be so high that it's not possible to calculate like uh, live. So for uh, real user monitoring, if the metric overhead, like if it takes 10 seconds to calculate, uh, we're not gonna be able to report that. Another uh, possible interpretation of, of real time that we have to think about is like in a WebPerf API context, uh, can it be calculated before the page is unloaded? For example, what if we wanted to give you an API that told you the longest uh, delay for a user input? Every time we get an input, we know it's the longest one so far, but until the page is unloaded, we don't know which one was like definitely the longest. So we have to think about that uh, as well. Uh, next, good top level metrics, we say there should be as few as possible, they should be orthogonal, we just mean that they should be different. Uh, if we have multiple top level metrics measuring the same thing, uh, that's a real waste of energy. Uh, so now I'm gonna go over uh, the use cases we have for these top level metrics. First off, the lab. We're running benchmarks either locally on your machine to debug and improve performance, or we're running them on like continuous integration. One thing to know about the lab is that there's a lot less data generally than there is for real user metrics. And that means that it's very, very important that things be stable and elastic. A, a big value of the, the lab is being able to really reproduce and pinpoint changes in performance. And the more stable and elastic a metric is, the better it is for lab. Uh, sometimes that puts it in odds with being simple and interpretable. Uh, lab metrics do not require real time. So let's say like you take a trace of Chrome and then you spend 10 minutes processing and you get your metrics, that's maybe okay for the lab. You have to have some kind of uh, limit on your continuous integration, but it, the time can be a lot longer than it can be if you were in a WebPerf API or a RUM context. One thing that's really complicated about the lab is uh, understanding performance of uh, user input. And so you might think, uh, okay, we want to see how long it takes to respond to a click. Uh, we'll load the page, we'll wait three seconds, and then we'll click. Then you have like this arbitrary three-second rule for clicks. And when people regress your metric in the lab, maybe they'll say like, oh, wow, it's really important that I don't do extra work before three seconds, I'll, I'll move it back. And they're not trying to game the metric, but it'll, it'll kind of shift the way things perform anyway. And maybe three seconds wasn't like the right timing, maybe like at 2.5 seconds or or 3.5 seconds, there's like this big chunk of work in the, that your page is actually not responsive. So 
you can think about like different ways to handle this. Like, well, what if we randomize when the input was? Oh no, then our metric is not stable. It's going to vary um, when the input was. Uh, so, like, the way that we actually handle this is we try to think of ways to look at like what are all the possible times when the user could have have uh, produced an input, and what was blocking the main thread at that point in time. So that's how we come up with metrics like time to interactive and uh, total blocking time. The next use case is WebPerf APIs. So uh, WebPerf API is an API that web developers can use in their web page or that our analytics providers can put into JavaScript so that uh, more people can access it. It's really, really critical that when we expose something to a WebPerf API, it's representative and accurate. Uh, it, it's a big cost to telling developers there's you know, an important performance metric if it's not going to be actually important or accurate. It needs to be real time. It's, it's just not really possible to make an API where it's not real time. And uh, you do have a large volume of data, so you could sacrifice some, some uh, interpretability or stability or elasticity. But uh, again, it's critical they be simple so that other browser vendors can implement and they can be polyfilled if possible. And clear definitions are, are really critical too. Uh, the last use case is our own real user monitoring. So the Chrome user experience report actually comes from Chrome's real user monitoring where we're trying to understand how does Chrome perform in A-B tests, how does Chrome perform uh, just overall in the wild. And of course we still care that metrics are representative and accurate, but we have a ton more room to experiment. We could just mark a metric as experimental and look at outliers as they come in and try to understand it. So we can do a lot more frequent iteration with uh, internal real user monitoring than we can with WebPerf APIs. So that was a lot about metrics. Um, I wanted to give an example to kind of clarify some of the things I'm talking about. Uh, the example is the largest contentful paint metric my team developed recently. So first we have some very key moments in the, the page load. This is uh, the user experience part of the page load that we're trying to measure. First off, something paints on the screen. You know, like, like this page is, is probably going to load. Something is happening. I, I click the link. Uh, that's currently captured by first contentful paint. Then like the, the main content of the page is actually loaded. I, I can tell if, if this is a useful web page. And finally, uh, I can click on things. Uh, I can interact with the page, scroll, that tells me more if it's usable. So the goal for Contentful Paint is to really uh, figure out this main content loaded part. Like, can we get a metric that, that gives us that? Uh, there's been some prior work you're probably aware of in this area. The first metric is speed index. It's the average time at which visible parts of the page are displayed. Uh, it's representative and it's accurate. It's really interpretable because it's a point in time. Um, one really awesome thing about using the average time at which visible parts of the page are displayed is sometimes you know, like, like you'll have a race condition between one piece of the page or another, or you'll have um, you know, some shifting in the page, and this really smooths that out so that it makes the, the metric very stable and elastic, which is super cool. And in fact, like the only thing I don't like about speed index is that it's not real time. We've tried to put it into Chrome directly, and we just can't um, maintain it in, in an efficient, like, low overhead way. Uh, so uh, another attempt at this is the first meaningful paint metric. This metric is a heuristic. It's kind of complicated. We take the first paint after the biggest layout change in the page. It's representative because we're trying to, uh, to figure out, you know, like, when is the main content displayed. It's interpretable because it's a point in time. And it's much faster, it's, it's real time, so that's really great. But the big problem is it's not very accurate. Uh, because it's a heuristic and it's kind of complicated, it produces weird outliers in about 20% of the cases, and it's really hard to fix it because we don't know what exactly about the heuristic made it good for the 80% the of cases, so changing it for the other 20% is really difficult. It's also uh, not simple, stable, or elastic. So first we set out with a list of priorities. All of our metrics we, we always prioritize above everything else being representative and accurate. We really, really cared about getting a real-time metric. Uh, if we're not gonna have that as a requirement, we would just use speed index. The metric needs to be interpretable. People need to understand what it means. Like it took X seconds for the content to, put, to display as opposed to like your score is 72. 
And it needs to be simple. So ideally, we can um, put it in standards and polyfill it, things like that. So uh, the main uh, insight that someone on our team had is that like, we can get pain events in real time. We can get them very quickly. Could we just use the pain events to try and figure out a way to make a metric that's simple and accurate? Uh, so we brainstormed and we came up with a bunch of ideas. What if we took the largest text paint in the viewport? What if we took the lar last image to paint in the viewport? What if we combine those together? And we implemented all of these things, the largest, the last, the, the images, the text, and uh, one of them or both of them. And we tried them all out. The way that we did this is we built a, a tool. So let me go over this screenshot because it's a little bit confusing how our tool works. Uh, there's two rows, the top row, uh, interspersed, you can see like uh, the metrics and colors, like last TFP, uh, with screenshots of the page. So we can see like what was painting at the time, and then this bottom row is uh, like the actual paint events. Uh, so what we did was we uh, we got these types of film strips from uh, over a thousand sites, and we looked at the metrics values and the layouts and the screenshots. You know, debug to make sure first, is the metric doing what we intended it to do? Are we actually like doing the last text paint or whatever? And then which one is best? The largest image or text paint in the viewport was best. So yay, largest contentful paint. Uh, but actually, it wasn't quite that simple. It would be great if we could just define it like that, but there were some edge cases to handle. So the first one is splash screens. Uh, this is a film strip of Twitter loading. And you can see they have their, their logo, and then uh, a loading spinner, and then finally we get the, um, some dialogues, but we get like the, the main text of you know, the, the um, name of the conference. And at that point, the, the page is, is main content's loaded. What we realized was that uh, basically the, the logo and the, the spinner, if we just invalidated those as candidates for largest contentful paint when they're removed from the DOM, we actually get largest contentful paint in the right place for this page. And looking at lots and lots of different film strips like this, it worked really well. So we invalidate elements that are removed from the DOM. Uh, then there's a similar case with background images. I actually can't find a lot of great examples of pages with background images that are just super simple. So here's uh, one that's more typical. On the left is the page's actual background image. And then on the right is uh, three film strips. So here is like kind of where the first contentful paint is. It's actually not the background image or anything. It's just kind of some stuff that happened to load. Uh, here's where the actual background image paints. And uh, that would have been our uh, largest contentful paint. But then uh, later on, this uh, logo paints. And that should be like our real largest contentful paint. And if we found uh, with these types of pages that if we uh, just invalidated the background image as a candidate, that we, we generally get these types of results with the, the best, largest contentful paint. Then there's also, like you should see, like in our tool, this is another example of a screenshot, and it doesn't quite line up with our tool. It's kind of a janky tool, sorry. Um, but you can see all the reds are text paints. And what you might think of as a user, as like a paragraph, is pretty different than like how things actually paint. Uh, so we uh, aggregate to block level elements uh, for text paints to make this a little bit more normalized. Uh, another problem uh, is that, uh, especially pages with an infinite scroll, you're looking at a feed or a timeline, and as you scroll, uh, new images and new text keep coming into the background. Uh, not, not the background, the foreground. And they continually uh, update the largest contentful paint. So we actually uh, stop measuring largest contentful paint at the first user input to, to deal with this. Uh, so we did a lot of film strip validation, uh, but we wanted to, like, after we looked at the thousand film strips uh, and then looked at them many, many times as we get through edge, each of these edge cases, uh, we really wanted to make sure that the, the data is, is accurate, that it works on a larger data set. Uh, so I've also been doing big query queries on HTTP archive. <laughs> uh, this um, is the largest contentful paint versus speed index, which we know we really like, like is a great main content painted <coughs> metric. And you can see there's a 0.83 correlation, which we're really happy with. It correlates really well to speed index. Uh, but what about orthogonality? Does it just, like, all the performance metrics just correlate? Uh, so, no, they don't, which is good. Uh, this is the same uh, type of query, except we have largest contentful paint and first contentful paint. 
You'll notice there's this like diagonal line here. Uh, that's because the largest contentful paint can't be like before the first contentful paint. Um, but on the other side of the line, there's this big spectrum of like sometimes the largest contentful paint is really close and sometimes it's really far away. And uh, there's, there's not as much of a correlation. So it's definitely like a different metric. Uh, so that was uh, our, our metric stop on uh, the journey to uh, browser vendor island. Um, I hope it was useful. When we look back at uh, how we developed this metric, I think the big gap is not being part of a broader community, not involving the web community as much. Uh, so we'd really like to fix that for next time. Uh, here on Browser Vendor Island, we're a little outdated with our communications, so we have an email address. <laughs> and that's my team email address. Uh, if you'd like to be involved in uh, performance metric design, uh, please let us know. I'm, I'm, uh, we're really excited to work with the broader community more. Give it a couple of seconds. I also have the slides online if you don't have time to take a picture. Okay, so with that, I'd like to switch on to monitoring. We have metrics, but then we need to actually monitor them both in the lab and in the wild to make sure that performance doesn't regress. Otherwise, you kind of, why do you have metrics? Uh, so I'll talk about uh, this kind of, I, I see monitoring as a, a stage. You, you go into the lab, then you do A-B testing, and then you do real user monitoring. So let's start with the lab. And by this, I mean, again, uh, performance benchmarks that you either run locally or run like on continuous integration. Uh, so there's some pros and cons about uh, lab testing. The coolest thing about lab testing is it's super fast. You can run a benchmark locally or kick off web page test or have something on your con continuous integration. Uh, the goal of lab testing is repeatable results. And so a regression is detecting, detected. You can repeat the test until you find like which change did it. Then you can keep repeating the test with the debugging tool until you find like what part of that change. Uh, and it, it's really great for like repeating and debugging. Uh, another cool thing about lab testing is you can try out performance ideas that you could never ever launch. Like, what if we just cut out half of our code? We we did an experiment on Chrome where we just cut out like massive amounts of code and, and like does it change different metrics? Uh, so you can do things that are, are really experimental and out of the box. The huge limitation with lab testing is that it's just impossible to model every user to your site. You're always gonna have gaps in the difference between the lab and the end users. Uh, so that obviously means that like, some regressions are just not gonna be caught by lab testing. But it also means like when you're doing those fun tests um, uh, locally, trying to come up with an idea for performance improvement, you, you know, maybe locally you get a 50% performance improvement, but usually in the wild it's going to be less because you're, you're gonna naturally optimize to the, the test. And uh, in the wild you're gonna end up with like a different configuration or many, many, many different configurations. Uh, so I've been working in the lab testing space for a really long time and I kind of feel like the problem, just really the big problem in the space boils down to two competing goals. On the one hand, we want our tests to be reproducible. We need to be able to like, detect which change caused the regression and then like, what part of that change and just repeat, repeat, repeat until we can make sure we, we've addressed it. But on the other hand, uh, the tests need to be realistic. Otherwise, we're not really using our time well. I'll talk about realism uh, first. So this is a slide from uh, a Google I.O. talk by the V8 team. And it's kind of about like, how they changed around their benchmarks. Uh, the colors are the different subsystems of V8. And at the top, they have synthetic benchmarks, octane, speedometer. And you can see those pink bars are like super long in the synthetic benchmarks. So if you were thinking about optimizing V8, you would probably want to make that pink bar shorter. Uh, maybe you could take like the, the orange bar and make it a little better and that, that would be a, a pretty good trade-off. Overall, it would be much shorter. Uh, the problem is that on the bottom of the chart, we have like 25 top sites, and uh, that pink bar is super short in most of those sites. So uh, depending on which benchmark set you're using, you would do really different optimizations. And we really want to get things as close as possible to this bottom set as, as we can. So how we handle that in Chrome's benchmarks is we, we test on many different hardware configurations. We actually record real websites and then replay them. We don't have as many, like we've been slowly winnowing out synthetic cases and really focusing on actual web pages. And we uh, simulate a bunch of different network conditions. 
Uh, so back to reproducibility. Most of the time I spent was on improving reproducibility. So I have a couple slides on how I did that, and I'm hoping that it translates a bit. The first thing that we, we've never been able to, to really get good reproducible results in VMs. We use real hardware, and we even take that a step further. We buy all the hardware in the same lot, and sometimes we even tie it like, to the exact same device, but if not, we have like, you know, one configuration, it's got the same OS, everything about it is the same, it's the same hardware lot. On mobile, it's really, really important to make sure that the devices are cool if you're running on real devices. The battery can, like, uh, if the device gets hot, that changes a lot of the performance metrics. So um, you can just use like ADB to check the, the battery and CPU temperature and wait until it goes down before you run another round of the test. Uh, next is super important to turn off all background tests on the machine you're running on. And we have a lot of work to reduce randomization. So we record and we play real web pages. If you're working on a web page, that doesn't make sense, but maybe it would make sense to freeze some parts of the page, like, like third parties. Um, one thing that we do on our recordings is we also freeze uh, JavaScript APIs that introduce randomness, so math.random, date not now, things like that. We just make them return the same value, so that makes the page more stable. And uh, we simulate network conditions uh, to make it more consistent. Another thing that's really important for uh, reproducibility is what we call diagnostic metrics. Remember I said we had thousands and thousands of metrics and we're trying to focus on the top level? We still do have like thousands and thousands of metrics and the reason we have them is so that you know, when uh, one of the top level metrics uh, regresses, we can go and look down uh, the line at how all of the other metrics changed. So um, for like pages that, uh, for like load times, a lot of the changes in Chrome that affect load times are in the CPU. So one of our diagnostics is like, what's the CPU time to first contentful paint? What's the CPU time to largest contentful paint? And that helps us kind of narrow it down. Like, okay, how does that break down between subsystems, et cetera? Uh, another metric that we have that we found incredibly helpful has nothing to do with Chrome. We actually measure which processes are running in the background. And we count the number and then we have a list. So let's say that your performance test is running and there's a big spike and it goes back down and you're, you're sure that was noise. You just look at that place in the graph and uh, you check your diagnostic metric for what processes, like are there, are there more processes than normal? Then you like look at what they were. And it's a really good way to find like things to kill because there isn't a great list of like background processes you should probably kill. Uh, so this is like uh, a note about looking at timelines. We use this thing called a reference build. So in this image, the, uh, the yellow is the actual build we're testing. That's tip of tree chromium. And the green is just uh, the same build of chromium being run over and over again. And we can see like up here and over there, we just got some blips. Uh, and the blips happen in both of the builds. So we don't really worry too much about that. It's impossible to get rid of all the noise. Uh, but we do see that the yellow one actually like uh, at, at the end there, it, it hops up, and the green one did not. So we know that that's a real regression. It's just this like, super simple, really visual way to, uh, to check for regressions and just sort out the noise. But I think one of the biggest things we've done to improve uh, reproducibility is just to improve how we do change detection in general. So uh, specifically about comparing two versions, uh, you see, like, we ran version A and version B, and version B is higher, but how do we know it's not just noise? Maybe they're the same and there's just noise in the test. Well, we can add more data points, right? Uh, now we have more runs of version A and version B, and it kind of looks like version B is still worse, but uh, I don't know. Um, should we take the average? Well, that kind of smooths it out unnaturally. We could do the median, but I don't know. One thing I've heard is that you could actually take, like, the smallest, uh, number from each run and say like, well, the rest are probably more noisy. Uh, but the big thing that we did that made uh, the biggest difference in being able to really understand uh, whether these two uh, sets of points were different is to try and think of performance as like a, a distribution. And it's actually like, usually not a normal distribution. It's usually like a long tail or like bimodal or trimodal. And uh, if you have these two sets of points, 
you want to know whether they're in the same distribution. Or you can at least see with the hypothesis test that they're not in the same distribution. And that's what we do. So the, the biggest point here that I wanted to make is, uh, again, going back to them not being normally distributed, the t-test is not a good hypothesis test for this. Uh, but there's many others that handle uh, that type of data well. We use Man Whitney U, but any of these or others should be fine. Uh, so next, the next thing we do on Chromium, we have lab testing, and that gives us uh, some initial data and protects us from regressions. Uh, but we have uh, several other steps. And the, the biggest thing that we do to both prevent regressions and to uh, test performance improvements is A-B testing. And uh, I, I did want to point out, like from Simon's talk, like when we do A-B testing on web properties at Google, we always do server side so that we can like really um, not have that impact the performance and be able to understand performance changes better. Uh, so uh, pros and cons of A-B testing. They're really great for actually predicting the real world effect of performance optimizations. You can see like out in the real world, how does a random sample of, of users, how are they affected? And uh, if you launch new features through perform for A-B tests, you can see like for sure they're not gonna regress your key performance metrics. Uh, the biggest limitation is just that it's, it's hard to A-B test every single change. And um, if you do start to get closer in that direction, it's hard to manage all of the A-B tests. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say about A-B tests is it really should be called controlled experimentation. Uh, instead of an A and a B, we usually have a control group and then any number of variations. Like, why would you have variations instead of a B? Uh, I'll give you an example from, from many years ago. I was a front-end developer, and we wanted to know, like, how much does extra JavaScript impact our page load time? How much overhead do we have? So we added 10 kilobytes and 20 kilobytes. And these were big numbers at the time, uh, and 50 kilobytes. <laughs> and uh, compare them to the control to see like, what effect it had. I, I find that the method is really valuable in performance a lot to compare multiple different implementations. Uh, so another thing I, I wanted to know is that like, if you have something you're launching via user opt-in, that is not the same as a controlled experiment. Whatever made the user click the box to say, yes, I want to try this, is probably something different about that user, and there's more that's different about those user groups than than you can imagine. Uh, another example from way back in the day before SSL everywhere was a thing, I used to work on a site where we had a settings page and you could click it to get you know, the SSL all the time. And we were thinking about launching it to the world and my director asked like, Annie, how much slower are those users? And I looked and they were 256 milliseconds, they're 250 milliseconds faster. And no matter how I sliced the data or anything, they were just faster. And you know, it's not really possible, you have the handshake and everything, uh, SSL is gonna take longer, but there was something about the users that knew that they wanted to go into the settings page and they wanted to tick that box. Maybe they wanted to buy better hardware, maybe they wanted better internet connections too, but uh, there, there's a lot of uh, bias in opt-in. Uh, so back to experiment groups, uh, some best practices are to, to just use equal size groups. And then one thing that we see happening a lot is at the experiment end, there's some weird thing that we didn't expect. And we're like, well, maybe group B is just weird, or maybe they're slower at the 90th percentile. And the way to address this is before the experiment starts, you can pick the groups and not change anything and see if group B like, was maybe different before the experiment started. We call it a pre-period. What if the experiment's going and you need more data? Uh, you can just keep running over a long time period, that is more data, or you can increase the group size. Those are like kind of the big options that you have. Um, one thing you might consider before increasing the group size is again running a pre-period. Uh, so now uh, the last part it, I'm going to talk about is real user monitoring. Uh, the good thing about real user monitoring is it's like the absolute ground truth for uh, what is the user experience, uh, as well as your metrics can measure it but it's really, really hard to, uh, to reproduce. It's really hard to debug. And um, by the time you, you've detected a regression, like your users are already like, feeling that pain. Uh, so why is it so hard? There's a lot of reasons, but I, I just listed a few. So your, your user base is very diverse, is one thing. So maybe just a subset of the population is, uh, is experience a problem, but it's hard to tease that out. There's mixed shift effects. Uh, what this means is like uh, 
similar to the opt-in, you could have some kind of uh, bias in like the population of your site. For example, if uh, a new country comes online and they have lower end devices, you might see your, uh, like as those people are coming online, your performance numbers get like slightly, slowly worse and worse. And there's lots of different ways that this can happen and it's, it's pretty confusing. Uh, there's also like lots of things out of our, our control. On Chrome, like Patch Tuesday kind of throws everything, uh, in, a wrench in everything on Windows. Like it's not just that like Windows is updating and like it might be different, but there's also like people restarting their computers has an effect on performance. Uh, so that there's, there are things that are out of control entirely. Um, and then when we finally get to the root of the problem, you wouldn't believe like in every project I've worked on, it's not just Chrome, uh, how, how many times it's actually just a change, especially performance improvement, uh, just a change in metric definition. So start there. Uh, look at things that could have impacted the way that you're measuring. So what can you do about all of it? Uh, like some other people have suggested, um, and, and a lot of this uh, I would kind of refer back to Emily's deck. It was really awesome, so I actually cut this uh, short on my slides. Uh, I say to use percentiles here and monitor the median for like the regular user experience and also a high percentile. Um, and those are great to monitor, but like the, the chart that Emily showed with the, with the heat map that shows like both how much, uh, how many people are using your site and also like what's the distribution. Understanding like how the distribution of performance is changing is really important. Uh, what can you do about that mix shift? Your population is changing. Uh, so the first thing, like kind of the turning it on and off again of real user monitoring is checking for volume change, like how many people are accessing the site. Did it go way up? Did it go way down? Then you can try splitting the data. Uh, we find, find it really helpful for, to split by country. We always split by platform. We look at like Windows and Mac and Android separately. Uh, and then further, we split by device types, so like uh, either device year or like actual devices. Uh, and then I cut this section really short because I really, really liked what Emily said about thinking in terms of traces and not events when you're trying to break down a big metric into small ones. The big thing that you need to be able to do is like you have this shift in the 90th percentile. Okay, how did the breakdown of that metric look before and after the shift? So you have to associate uh, all of the different metric breakdowns together. And like if, if you put them all in one trace all together or some other way of linking them together, it's going to be a lot easier to do that. But the big thing I would recommend is like to try and forget about all that stuff as much as you can by trying to just make them a little bit more like A-B testing. So when you're launching new features, uh, always launch things via A-B test. Then, then you can just get really clear numbers on whether that was a problem or not. The same thing for when you launch uh, your product. You can launch it as a canary and look at like, okay, on uh, 1% of the population that has a new version, are they different than the 99% and then 2%, 3% and kind of look at it as it rolls out, is it different? Okay, but what if it's rolled out and like you're still not sure? You could use a holdback, which is just taking like maybe 1% of the population and giving them the old version. Okay, so that is, uh, is my trip to, to, to where I live on the uh, browser vendor island. Uh, my takeaways are that uh, metrics are very hard, but uh, we would love your help. And um, please email us if you, if you want to contribute to designing new performance metrics. Uh, big takeaway is that we want to focus on user, performance, user experience as opposed to the smaller bits. They're just there to help get the overall experience. And uh, that lab testing is great for quick iteration, but for really understanding what's going on in the wild, I think A-B testing is the way to go. Okay, thanks everybody. I love talks about performance metrics so much. That was great. It's very, it was, and it was, it was like a perfect mixture because it validated some things that I thought I knew, but then like introduced me to some new things as well. So thank you very much for that. Okay, so we had a lot of questions. Um, we'll try to get to as many as we can. So, so we'll start off with this one. So first off, thank you for your, for your work. This is from the audience on metrics and monitoring. We're all benefiting greatly from it. Um, and second part, what are some of the kind of more experimental metrics right now that you're excited about? Some things uh, that are on the horizon. So Yoav and I, I think Yoav's here, uh, still are just starting to experiment on like what can we do for single page app navigations? 
Uh, my team is also starting to look at uh, abort metrics, which is not a performance metric, but uh, it's um, you know really important for understanding uh, are users happy? Are they uh, abandonment? Like are they leaving the page? And there's a, a separate team uh, that works closely with us that's doing uh, trying to do better uh, scrolling and animation metrics. Cool. So are those things that you're directly involved in or you're kind of just adjacent in terms of those two? Uh, I'm directly involved in the first two and then scrolling in animation I can at least tell you who to talk to. Okay. And so what about cumulative layout shift? Hearing some talk about uh, that. Is that something that you're involved in or? It is my team but I didn't work on it directly. I'm really excited about it. It's our first like real like kind of ex uh, user experience metric that's not like performance related that we're trying to to get to developers and, and see if, if it can make a difference. I think it's, it's a pain point for a lot of people. They start to load a page and it moves around and things pop in. And so we're really hoping that, that cumulatively outshift can help uh, raise visibility there. So would you mind, and I don't, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but can you maybe for people in the audience who are less familiar with like what cumulative layout shift is, because it, it was just announced, right? Yeah. Like that it, as, as something that you folks are working so on. So layout shift is any time that the page layout shifts. So um, so in some frame, <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're moving to the left, you're moving to the right, you're moving up or down, like everything, things are moving, but you're not scrolling or interacting with the page. Cumulative layout shift is the, the cumulative amount of shift that you have over the page load uh, in general, or over the, the entire, I, I'm not sure actually what that endpoint is. If it's, I think it's for the, the whole page, uh, okay. like the, the time you're on the page. There's a, Paul Irish presented about that, right? Didn't he at the Dev Summit? I believe so, yeah. Yeah, so if there, anybody who's interested in learning more about that, there's, there's a, a, a There's a, definitely a slides at CDS that explain it way better than I am. Um, Oh, so I don't know if you're gonna be able to answer this one. You've, um, how much of the Chrome RUM metric ends up in Google search? How, like, what do, you, what do you know about the so algorithm? they do not <laughs> tell us how they do the search algorithm. <laughs> so this is just not something that you're gonna be able to like. Uh, yeah, they, they, don't, they don't tell us. <laughs> okay, um, let me see. How does largest contentful paint handle font display swap? Uh, so we do count uh, the before, like, like whatever renders first. So if the the, the default renders and then the font comes in, uh, we uh, do count it when when it first displayed. Okay. Um, okay. So this is an interesting question. Wait, so when you're testing in the lab, do you actually load the actual website? Is that what you're testing on, or are you grabbing like a har file and, and it's we all use web page replay? Uh, WPR Go, it's in our Catapult repo. It actually records and replays full websites. So we have a recording of this site and we're replaying that recording with network simulation. We're not actually loading a real site because that would have so much variability. Yeah. Um, this is interesting. How much, how much do you, I don't know, you personally or you Google, work with other browsers to ensure that the same metrics can be measured across browsers? Oh, so most of that work happens in the WebPerf working group. Uh, yeah. Yoav, who's here, is really involved in Ilya uh, as well. Uh, I don't personally do a lot of that work, but I'm looking to get more involved. Cool. So, because right now, largest contentful pane is just Chrome only. It's not available in any other browsers. So. Yeah. Um, actually, I think, let me see. Sorry, there were a lot of questions, so I'm just trying to find <laughs> ones that I haven't asked yet. We're done. <laughs> <laughs> Are you done? No, it's okay. <laughs> Um, okay, so somebody asked if largest contentful paint can show up after or be greater than visually complete. Uh, it is possible if, if you know, like, like uh, one of the things that's really difficult is for something like a carousel of like, you know, new content coming in. So if you're continually animating or doing new things that it will keep updating. So okay. it is possible. It doesn't generally, like when I, looked at the metric correlations on HTTP archive, like that scatter plot, it's rare, but possible. Okay, I was thinking another response to that is if people are, because LCP is just Chrome only, if you're looking at like all of your visually complete data in one bucket and your LCP data in another bucket, you're looking at like actually different buckets. Of yeah. Data. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, oh, I think we went through all the ones that I know of, that, I, that I've got on my list anyways. So thank you very much. This is awesome. Thanks. Thank